Pearson Ravitz story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate OBGYN at the height of her career. But when a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery, her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Dr. Pearson became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Ravitz, Dr. Pearson founded Pearson Ravitz, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Ravitz serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Ravitz, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRavitz.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Ravitz advisor. Life planning. Life planning? How am I supposed to plan my life when I can barely plan my day? Let's find out how life planning can allow us to get a macro view of our financial habits so that we can make sure that we are living and spending consistent with our values. Find out how. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a show by me, Dr. Bradley Block, and this is a practical guide for practicing physicians where we interview experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Whaley Gray, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. It's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The honor is mine. So just to introduce you to the audience, you are a recovering anesthesiologist. You're an anesthesiologist, fellowship trained in sleep medicine, although at this point you have recovered from anesthesiology and now you're practicing just sleep medicine. So, I mean, if you were near me, I'd probably be sending you patients because in otolaryngology, we have a good overlap in that. I can't tell you how many people that I need that need help with their insomnia that I would love to send you. <laughs> That's great. Those are usually the more complicated cases, you know, when I get that. And it's hard, but it is satisfying when you see results with patients who have been struggling with lifelong insomnia. Like an onion. But that's not what we're here to talk about, right? We're here to talk about you host the Dare to Dream podcast, which you recently pivoted to the Dare to Dream travel podcast. So we're going to talk about that more towards the end. But the Dare to Dream podcast. So why did you start that? Because I thought we were living the dream, right? We're living the dream. We finished our training. We're both attendings, right? Established. And we're living the dream. So what do we need the Dare to Dream? Why do we need to Dare to Dream if we're already living the dream? That phrase has a very special meaning for me. This goes back about a little over two years ago when we're in the thick of the pandemic. And I actually, at that point, thought I was living my dream. You know, I had study hard, med school, residency, fellowship. And finally, you know, my poor family that had to like keep moving around, you know, during my training, finally, we were settled in this very lovely little town in Vermont, right on the Canadian border. We found our dream property. You know, my husband and I found like this farmhouse on 140 acres and like, it's beautiful. So, you know, we love nature and hiking. And so we're like, wow, we're living in a dream. You know, we're in this beautiful location and I get to go to work in an environment that I love. You know, I hear physicians sort of in social media and various communities sort of talk about burnout and, you know, how everything's hard. And yes, I had gone through my own burnout because my husband and we had our first baby when I was an intern. You know, we didn't have any help. And so we already went through a burnout story. So I'm like, no, this is now the beginning of my dream life. <laughs> that was the backdrop. But of course, we, you know, when we sort of assume everything is great and perfect and picture perfect, something comes along. So for me, it was a little shatter bubble that I thought I was living in. You know, this was about five years into being an attending. So I was like, oh, you know, this is great. Well, it's only five years. I mean, people usually have a career that's like 30 plus years long. And I encountered the first obstacle, which was the amazing people that moved my whole family to and settle into this new town. The sort of the leaders of the hospital were changing. Like people were leaving, you know, docs were leaving. The administrators that I actually was really impressed with when I interviewed at this hospital were leaving. You know, people changed. I didn't like this at the time, but 
a theme of life is change. I was very distraught because it seemed like the change was for the worse. It seemed like my dream was being shattered. Changes were happening at work where all of a sudden that narrative that I was hearing other physicians talk about was happening in front of me, where I felt like I had no autonomy, no input into how things were being run in my practice. And this was coming from where I thought I was living the dream job, the dream life. That sort of started a whole, and now in retrospect, I call it midlife crisis. I was actually just about to turn 40 at the time. So it's actually good timing for midlife crisis. And you were in rural Vermont, right? So it's not like, oh, there are three other hospital systems right around the corner. Like where I am in New York, they're all getting swallowed up and coalescing, but there's still like, there's Catholic Health, there's Northwell, there's Columbia Cornell, there's NYU, Montefiore, like there's a ton to choose from. You, it's like, that's the one hospital, right? That is exactly right. And I actually was at that time going to three hospitals, but all, you know, sort of in an agreement with the same employer. But you're right, like there's not many players in town. And even I know private practice in most physicians' minds is like a dying thing, but it's even harder in a rural environment where, you know, there was like, there was no payer mix, you know, it's like Medicare, Medicaid for the most part. Yeah, it felt like at the time that my options were really limited. There was like, you know, sort of an immediate, I knew somebody who was in a different, like about maybe two and a half hours away who was like, oh, maybe you want to come move here. We have a great system and, you know, everything seems great. And I thought, wait a minute, I've heard that story before, you know, five years ago when I moved here and everything seemed perfect. And, you know, this is, you know, coming from my dream job. And so I just felt really discouraged as a doctor. I mean, as you know, Brad, like, We were like the cream of the crop, right? Like we did not end up where we are today because we're like, oh, well, hopefully we'll make it. Like we worked hard and there was like really nothing holding me back. I mean, when I applied to medical school, I'm like, I'm going to change the world. You know, like I was very and still am very idealistic. And so I wasn't about to sort of sell out my soul to what I thought weren't like aligned with my what I felt was my mission and purpose in life, which, you know, medicine is very much part of that. Like I love being a doctor. And so it was very discouraging. I actually, at that point, I was like, maybe I should look into something else. You know, like I have the internal resources, like I can pivot and maybe I can just, you know, leave medicine and do something else. Just for the listeners, this isn't one of those podcasts, right? This isn't one of those podcast episodes where you encounter burnout and then you quit medicine, right? Where this is heading. So if you're about to like pause or go to the next episode or unsubscribe, whatever, like keep listening. So she ended up staying in medicine. Spoiler alert, I'm actually at the exact same job. (laughs) I live in the exact same house, the same dream property, but much happier. So yes, I just felt like, let me look at something else because it's like I can pivot. Like I know how to learn new stuff, but I didn't know a lot of stuff at that time because the only thing I really knew how to do was aside from, you know, being a mom, sort of, and medicine was in the time from when I was a fellow to when I became an attending, I actually took a nine month sabbatical. And there were various reasons for that, including her family was kind of traumatized by having had a total loss house fire. We had just, you know, had a newborn. So we had a lot of sort of major life events. That wasn't what led to burnout. No, the burnout was actually before then. (laughs) The burnout was just juggling you know, having a newborn and being a resident and just not really knowing how to tap into support and, you know, being in a, like a new state and everything like that. So what I did was I just looked at one, and one other thing I knew how to do was learn about personal finance. Thanks to the white co-investor, I started like following his blog and I just learned everything. Like when at one point, you know, like 401k, like, you know, IRAs, like all that was complete Greek. Like it was more Greek than Greek itself to me as a resident. And so in like a very short amount of time, maybe, you know, a few months, and then I started, you know, building more and more on, t- on this knowledge or financial literacy, I started, you know, becoming pretty good at that. And so I actually felt pretty good with my own financial life and from not feeling well at all. So I was like, that is the only other life transformation. that I've- Wait, are you going to be a financial plan. Was that the pivot? That was my nefarious plan. I actually even remember the conversation where I sat down with my husband and I'm like, you know, this, do you want to move to, you know, two, three hours away? And he's like, no, we already did that. And so I was like, well, how about this other alternative? Why don't I just leave medicine and look into this other field? The only other thing that I really know how to do at that time. Were you, instead of like your 10 years of training, you like read a book and a blog. You're like, there we go. Yeah, I'll do that. There we go. So he was supportive. He's like, okay, well, do what you need to do. Just figure it out. It's okay. I support you. I do not want you to be unhappy. And, you know, money's not worth it. 
So I did the one thing that I knew how to do. This is in the middle of pandemic. I went to a training that was actually for financial advisors. I signed up for like classes on learning about financial planning. But this was from the Kinder Institute of Life Planning, which is a sort of a discipline that was started by financial planners. But it's asking, why are you saving money? You know, why are you investing is the life that you really want to build. And so that really appealed to me. Kinder, that name's familiar because I think this must have been three or four years ago where I had Jimmy Turner on the show, the physician philosopher, and he was the one that introduced me to the Kinder questions. There wasn't as much of a frame of reference. Like you took a class and you've actually had George Kinder on your podcast, you know, so there's less of a frame of reference, but this is not the first time for anyone who's been listening to me for that long, you know, not the first time that they've heard the name Kinder before. And so it seems like this was not just like any financial planning course. This was, as you referred to, and I think they referred to as life planning, right? It's like a very specific lens through which you look through your spending. Exactly. The why, you know, what are you living for? You know, because money is just a tool, which this also goes back a little bit of background around this time. You know, I was, like I said, sort of really focused on my like building I wasn't like in the fire movement per se, but it, that really much resonated with me, with me. So I was like, okay, let me, you know, try to save up money. I had my spreadsheets. I looked at them and like most people who are with this type of hobby, like there's not a lot of people you can share that with. So like my husband and I would look at it, like I had one close friend who I felt comfortable sharing with. So there was actually a moment just, you know, as a contrast, when I actually met this huge milestone that I had set for myself, for my personal financial life, for our, in my families. And I'm like, wow, I met this milestone. It's amazing. Are you able to share that with us? Not like the specific sum of money, right? I don't want you to broadcast that to the universe, but like, was it like a sum of money? Was it like that you'd pay down your debt? It was like a net worth goal, you know? So it was like, like okay. just, you know, th that's why the spreadsheet's coming. Cause you have, you know, you got your debt, you got your investments. And, you know, so I looked at this spreadsheet and I'm like, oh, look, we crossed it. Whoa, you know, I mean, it helped that the market yeah. was like, you know, a super bullish market for years. You're not there anymore. We're not there you anymore. Were, yes, you were there and you lost it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the point though, right? Like, so money is a tool. Like you look at the spreadsheet. I did not get this happiness. I mean, I felt this sense of like accomplishment. Yeah. It must've felt pretty good <laughs> yeah. still. Don't underplay it, but yes, but it didn't change anything. It wasn't a game changer. Actually, the White Claw Investor, like one of the books, again, he was a big influence when I first started learning financial literacy. And I think he... he Please stop plugging him though. My listeners, they're going to start listening to him instead of <laughs> okay, me. It's fine. Your podcast is very different. It's okay. Just to quote something in that book, which is, you know, when you get to your first million, you can like relax a little bit or something like that. It's some, you know, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> So like, I kind of felt that I'm like, hey, I got my milestone. I'm going to relax a little bit. And then so around this time was also when I went through this midlife crisis and the kinder questions, which your listeners are familiar with, and just that whole way of sort of looking at life and approaching life and, you know, learning how to make the most out of your life was re really resonated with me at that point because I was in a crisis. Well, actually, I do want you to go through the kinder questions again, because this episode with Jimmy was like four years ago. The last time I had him on the show, we actually talked about smoking meat. It had nothing to do with medicine or money or anything, although it's one of my most popular episodes. Can you go through kinder questions again? Yeah. And I'm going to paraphrase. I usually have it in front of me, but like I said, you know, the more I podcast, the more I think it's better to just, you know, be spontaneous. So these questions are life-changing and some will even say, you know, these are like the three most important questions that, that you'll ever consider an answer. And so question number one is fun, actually. So this one is, imagine that you're financially secure, that you have enough money for, and if you're someone who feels responsible for like your family or, you know, some other people that you're taking care of, like you and, you know, your family members, your kids, your wife, whoever it is, you have enough, you know, for now and in the future. So the question is, would you change your life in any way? And what would you change? Don't hold back, you know, use your imagination. Imagine like, what would that life be like? and imagine a life that's really like what you want. So that's my paraphrase of, you know, the kinder question, life planning number one. And so it's fun. Who doesn't want to think about their life if they don't have to worry about money? You know, thinking back to the point when I was in sort of my midlife crisis mode, like I was just escaping pain, right? Like I wasn't necessarily wanting to become a financial, like that, I didn't necessarily feel my calling was to be a financial planner, but I was just thinking, what other way can I, you know, could do that that felt more aligned with who I want to be and keep my integrity and my dignity and also bring home a paycheck, right? So financial independence is very important. 
just kind of as a thought exercise. I'm not saying everyone should, you know, go fire. <laughs> and actually, we've covered that a little while ago with Jordan Grummet, who, as much as he's the godfather of fire, made a great argument for not pursuing fire, right? Because then you're front loading the work like we've already done. And who knows? We never know. And this is one of the other kinder questions. Like, you never know when the next day is going to yes. be your last, right? So one of those other kinder questions is, just, to, just yes, so we can, no. you know, move through them a little quickly. Number two, you have less time. So you have, you only have like five or 10 years to live. You know that. What are you going to do with your time? And then the last one is you only have a day to live. What are you going to do with your time? So just these thought experiments for recognizing what's important and prioritizing. That's actually how the Dare to Dream mission got started. So I attended this workshop. So the other thing that was important about this workshop was because I was not using CME money and it was my own money, I really tried to make the most out of it. So when they said, hey, does anyone want to volunteer, you know, speak in front of everybody and get life planned? I was like, yeah, I'm going to raise my hand because what do I have to lose? I got to get them. I'm going to milk anything, every penny out of this I can. Yeah. And that was the most amazing experience where I got to really sit and pause and verbalize all the things that I actually find important in my life. That's not just like chasing after, you know, a medical degree and all, you know, because that's also what an accomplishment in itself, but just other stuff, right? The other stuff that people don't usually sit down and try to figure out what's really important to them. And so at the end of that workshop, you know, after I felt like I had this life changing experience where I felt more clarity about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be in my life. Wait, I'm sorry. So what was it? Because it sounds like there was a big epiphany moment there, there, right? And that's really what you want to do is you want to share this epiphany with other physicians out there, right? So what was the epiphany, right? You got clarity, but what was that? Like, I want to see yeah. it through your yeah. lens. So this is one of the things that I try to encourage all doctors to do because it's not something that we're really trained to do, which is to use our imagination. So like dare to dream, right? This word, the term, like when we talk, it sounds like so silly, like why would anyone want to do that? It seems like a waste of time, but there is something about visualizing you start listing like, this is important to me. These values are important to me. Like the, this goal would be nice to do. And, and then you start actually imagining, like, let's just make it as real as possible in your imagination. So you maybe take yourself to six months in the future. So take yourself 20 years, cause that's too far away and too theoretical, but like six months in the future, here's a moment where all those things that you said, like, Hey, I want to be, I want to spend quality time with my kids. So you're imagining that moment where like you and your kids are laughing and you're having that connection. And so you're imagining to make this as real as possible, to be in the moment as possible, all the things that you really want. And that was my epiphany was when actually the life planner kind of painted that moment, that scene for me. And to other people, it sounded so simple because at the time it was just like, it was really me like having this moment with my kids laughing and, you know, my husband saying, wow, I could see that you're really happy. And it was none of those things I had at that time. And so it might be simple things, but that's the thing is, you know, we go after the hard things as doctors, but we don't necessarily go after the simple things because those may sometimes be harder to get. So I think there's something, it's not quite what you're saying, but like, as you're saying this, it conjures up an image in my mind of something that I really want to happen in my future, which is I... There, there is, contrary to popular belief, there is surfing on Long Island. It's not very good. It's really messy. It's all sand. And so when you're surfing at a reef, everything's more predictable because you know where the wave's going to be. But in sand, it's different. I want to surf with my boys. So I want to surf with all three of my boys. I mean, if my wife wants to come, that would be even better. At some point, I just want to be out there. It doesn't need to be on Long Island. It would be anywhere. But just surfing with all of us. I'll do, you know what I'll just say? With the whole family, all five of us surfing at the same time would be just such an amazing dream. Now, right now, the boys are three, five, and six. So like surfing in the ocean, not really, you know, and I'm not a very good surfer. You know, what do I need to do to make that happen? Okay, so this summer, maybe we'll schedule some surf lessons on the weekends with the boys. You know, maybe go on a vacation where we all like you know, get a little better, you know, like just little things here and there that I'm designing my life to make this end goal happen. But each step of the way is not like work, you know, it's all going to be for all of us. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt your, but like, that's just what I pictured of my. So that, that, that's a beautiful example. I love that you shared. I love that when you have that vision and that you're saying it out loud, and because that's what most people don't do, right? I mean, the nice thing about podcasting is that you can say this stuff out loud and now it's uh, everywhere on the internet. <laughs> and so you're accountable, but it is beautiful. So you might have this inkling in your brain. Like most people, they have like a quiet voice, like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool to do that? But they don't even take the time to stop and like even say it out loud. 
And then what you're also doing, you're like making it more real. Like, so in life planning, we would ask like, oh, you know, like, what would that, like, what do you feel when that's happening? Or like, what do the expressions on your boys look like, you know, when you're doing this? And so trying to like, just make it as real as possible, be as much in the moment as possible. And so that dream, like you get, you feel so close to that dream and you're like, that is so amazing. I have to get that. Because it gives you energy, like you, you're, you just get so excited. And then, you know, that like you said, then it's easy to take that next step. That next step would be like scheduling some surf lessons, you know, or, or, you know, like maybe, you know, scheduling a vacation where it would be, condi- you know, places where you can surf. And or you like, sharing it with your wife, like because she only be like, what, like what kind of dream is that? But if you share it with her, like if you say it, the more you say it to the people you love and the people you care about, like the more it just becomes closer to reality, and then they get it in their heads too. And they can help you make it happen. Yeah. So is that, so with the kinder questions, it helps you figure out your priorities. And then life planning, what you're doing is, because I mean, that was just one example for me and for you that was like six months from now, just trying to enjoy your kids really unfettered from your responsibilities. So how does that translate into life planning? That sounds more like event planning. Yeah. So life planning is there are certain processes, right? So like what, but the most important thing like is that torch statement. And the torch statement is that moment in time where in the not too far future, where you're imagining that all those elements kind of come true in in, in this like real life moment. And then you get clarity because then you're like, wow, I want that. And then planning part, you know, where we, you know, we do talk about like the ideal day, ideal week, ideal year, all, all of those things. So like, But it's actually not as regimented as you might think when you hear that term, because you're like, oh, there must be some process. Like there has to be a book, you know, like where you're filling out all the questionnaires. It's not that complicated because really when it comes to daring to dream and living our dreams, like you said, like if you have this vision and you have this, you get energized by it, you just make the next step. You don't have to make this like crazy elaborate plan because the thing is, the more elaborate, the more steps it takes, the less likely it's going to get done. So you just do the next thing and that next thing will get you closer. So the torch statement, what, so the torch statement is, I mean, for you was your description of that state of being family, but could you just define that a little bit? Yeah. The torch statement is really It's like a movie. So in the life planning process, usually, you know, we do kind of this like by the book in life planning, we're, you know, kind of going through answers that someone has to three questions and we're sort of elaborating on it. And a lot of life planning is also kind of like being present. So a lot of it is based on mindfulness. So we're listening into what the person is saying about what they want, but also we're trying to get the underlying feelings too. Because sometimes people will say something, you feel what they're saying and there's maybe sadness or something else that's in there. So you're also sort of trying to encapsulate that. And then, and then so exactly like, you know, when we give the torch statement, it is really just that it's that description of imagining what it is that they want in a moment in time. Got it. Okay. It's not really like a declaration. It's more of like a description of the event. Yes. It's a description of something. Yeah. It could be an event, but yeah, it could be an everyday moment. Or in your case, it could be like surfing, like with you're like on the surfboard (laughs) with the boys. What, prevented you from being in that place, you know, six months from when you originally made your torch statement was something that I've heard you refer to as tyranny of the urgent, right? So I'm sure that's something that plagues almost every physician. So what's the tyranny of the urgent? Ah, that's such a good question. Tyranny of the urgent is basically like all the things that are always kind of calling and saying, oh, we need, I mean, perfect examples are patient messages, right? I mean, so depending on who you're employed by, there's usually like some deadline, like, okay, you have to answer this within, you know, 48 hours or whatever it is. And the patient's like, oh, you know, I have a question, like, you know, this is really making me anxious. And so that's one example, you know, but it could also be, you know, there's a dentist appointment tomorrow. So there's, it's all the sort of events that are listed on your calendar. That's usually, you know, like planned with somebody else or some other entity or an obligation. But it's the, so, so, so that, you know, those would be examples of tyranny of the urgent. And the opposite of that is usually the really important stuff, which is like reading. And some people will put this on their calendar, which is actually exactly the point. You can bridge, you know, the non-urgent but important stuff to be, you know, in, in the urgent category as well, if you put on your calendar, but like, you know, reading a book to your kids, which 
by the way, like, you know, at that point when I was doing this life planning, I had never really done. I was just too busy to do it. I just, I just wasn't, I wanted to, but I just, it was just like never something that I did. And so something so simple, right? But it, I just had a time to just sit and I'm like, wait, like that, if my kids are 18 right now, I missed that opportunity and I'll, you know, never get that back. So I started doing that and very simple, but so satisfying. So put the stuff that is important, but doesn't make its way onto your calendar, maybe onto your calendar to just make sure that you do check that box. And then you get to check it off your list when you do it, which also you get that little dopamine hit that say, oh, I checked this off my list. <laughs> it's always nice. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. But the awful, the other stuff, just like having quiet time, you know, so, so a lot of people who are like high performing, like CEOs, and you know, a lot of them talk about the importance of just having blank space on your calendar. And so that's also something that would be the opposite of the tyranny of the urgent, but that's also really important. So when you have that tyranny of the urgent, like, oh, I've got to do this, and all these like worries, all these things, all these that you need to do, and they're occupying space in your head, like open apps on your phone, just draining your memory, draining your energy. How do you get them out of your head? That's a very good question. I think it's different for everybody. I think for me, it was really having this clear vision of what is it that I do want and then feeling like it's so real that I could have it. It just, and then it just made me really want it and to start, you know, start changing my life so that I could start living that dream. Oh, and so, so what else has happened in your life, if you wouldn't mind divulging it, because of life planning? Like what, where, now that you've got this like maybe guidepost, this direction that you're sailing in, to use the travel analogy, because you've pivoted to the Dare to Dream travel podcast, you know, what else is has been happening because of that? I, I think the easiest way to explain it is that I sort of reconnected with who I really am. And I think in medicine, I lost that part of myself. Like, in fact, I recently I looked at like my essay for, for you know, that I wrote to get into medical school. And I'm like, this is pretty nice. Like, this is a really, you know, <laughs> I like this yeah, person. Like, this is a pretty cool person. I like to get to know her. And that's what it was. Like, I, I forgot about that person. It was between all the exams and all the, all the call shifts and just everything we had to do. And on top of that, for me, it was, you know, starting a family when I was in the midst of internship. It was, yeah, I just, for, I forgot about that person. And so it just, I started finding my voice. So, and I used to be, and I still am, I'm an introvert. And so like, I just remember, you know, going to like med staff meetings, I just, you know, keep my head down and mostly be quiet. And so I just started speaking up more just because it was sort of like, I just let go of all these stuff that all the other stuff that wasn't really important. And I just felt more free to be who I am. Good pivot right there, because I was about to ask you, you know, because you started off saying that this all started when the leadership in your hospital changed and it ended up impacting you and your job and your livelihood, your quality of life. So then what ended up, but yet you're still at that job. So how did that change in perspective and priorities and recalibration end up allowing you to stay and be happy at your, at that same position? So, so there was a moment when I said, you know, my husband doesn't want to leave. We want to stay here. And at one point I wanted to quit medicine, but then after doing life planning, I realized that I love being a doctor. So I'm not going to quit just yet. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stay in medicine. I'm going to actually stay exactly where I am. And I have nothing to lose because I was going to quit anyway. And I'm just going to advocate, you know, for myself and for the, for just positions. And, and so I stayed where I was and I just really started speaking up. I started you know, to sort of just talking about physician wellness. I advocated for certain things. I actually brought a physician coaching program to my hospital. I convinced the administrators to actually fund it. So it was, you know, and even now we had a concentrated program that anyone could have signed up for all the physicians and APPs. And then, and then afterwards I negotiated with the admin to negotiate is, you know, I explained to them the value them. Of, yeah. of actually having like a long-term benefit. So all of the physicians and APPs at my hospital could have six sessions of physician coaching if they want to, like every year. So, you know, these things. And then the other thing that I realized was, you know, the stuff, some of the stuff that was draining me in my work, personally, it was a lot of the charting. I think I don't think I'm the only one. And so I had this seat. I had this idea. I was like, well, what if someone could chart for me? 
you know, what would that be like? And then if you look at like even the CEOs or the, you know, executives in my hospital, they all have their administrative assistants. They are charting for yeah. them when they're at meetings. Yeah. And so it wasn't that far, right? Email from the desk. Oh, right, exactly. Like, oh, can't even send their own emails, huh? <laughs> yeah. So so they understand the value of delegation and sort of, you know, doing the things that that only you can do and then, you know, having getting help on the other stuff that other people can do. So you have you can do more of what you're really good at and what you're most qualified to do. And so I I actually was able to negotiate for a scribe at work. So I got that. And then what was amazing was later there was, you know, an, another department that was kind of going through a hard time at my hospital. And then you know, they actually offered the scribe you know, to the, to a physician. So it sort of became a culture change. And then later, actually, any physician or AP who wanted a scribe at my hospital could get one. And so, yeah, so I mean, I work at a small hospital, you know, it's a rural critical care access hospital. But still, I mean, it's sort of it's pretty amazing that I was able to, you know, not one, I'd stay to see what I could do. And then two, to just, you know, in like two years time, make it a place where I fall is my dream job. Better watch out. You're going to end up with more leadership responsibilities you don't even want. All those changes that you're making to the benefit of your colleagues, they might elect you to nominate you with other positions and more responsibility. So the be careful. The great thing about life planning and sort of getting clarity on your life is it's actually one, it's much easier to say no to things you don't want. And two, you don't get FOMO because you're like, well, I don't, I didn't really want that. That wasn't aligned with what I want. So it's okay. Like it's okay to not go after that. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I love how this turned out, right? I love how it, you know, you wrapped it all up very in a neat little bow in the end. So if people want to hear more from you, if they want to hear your podcast, where can people find you? Where can people find you online? Yeah. So I, I'm on most of the social media, except for TikTok and Twitter. Okay. But I, so I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. If they want to find me, probably the best is on Instagram, Dream Physician at, on Instagram. If you are on Facebook and you're a physician. Literally and figuratively, because you are a sleep medicine doctor. So I love that handle. Perfect. If yeah. you do, if you're still in the dark ages like I am, and you are, you know, still into Facebook communities, please join the Dare to Dream Physician Travel Facebook group. I'm starting a new community there. So where, where I get to share some of, you know, my travels and some of the podcast content and just support physicians and living life to the fullest through travel. And dare to dream physician.com is my website. Fantastic. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing for physicians out there and for being the inspiration. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited to interview you on my podcast. I'm looking forward to it. And now a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit PearsonRavitz.com today and embark on a journey of safeguarding your future. Thanks for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast player. I'm also available for medical legal consulting and keynote speaking if you're interested, or to just give us some feedback on the show, email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. I'll see you next week. The ideas expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers.